Hello, today is February 1st, 2013. We're meeting today with Jason Sidoriak in Fort Collins, Colorado. My name is Brad Hoops. I'm the interviewer for the Northern Colorado Veterans History Project. Welcome, Jason. Uh, thanks for sitting down to, to, uh, to tell your story. Thanks for having me. You bet. Uh, let's start out, if we could. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, your date of birth, where you were born, a little bit about your family. Um, I was born in Rockville, Connecticut, so all the way on the other side of the country, um, November 6, 1987. Um, I was uh, born in a um, much lower class family, uh, kind of on the verge of poverty, if not in poverty. Um, uh, didn't really have a strong family. Eventually, my mom and dad split up, but um, uh, and then at times the I had to uh, live on my own, um, but then eventually my my aunt and uncle got word of uh, I have a twin sister that we're kind of like living from house to house, uh, and they picked us up, and that's when you know I finally had that strong family oh, wow. relationship. Uh, which was around the time I started going to high school. Um, did did so, you go to high school there in Rockville as well? Or, yeah, or, or in the area? Or East Harvard. So it was about the same area, yeah. Um, and so, and you know, went to high school, didn't, you know, just a regular kid. Uh, I did wrestling uh, growing up, um, I did a few martial arts. Uh, but besides that, didn't get too much trouble. I was. Even though I, I grew up in a pretty rough area, it's a pretty much of a, a straight edge. Um, and the second I got a chance to get out of high school, I, I joined the Marines. Okay, so that was your reason for joining the military. Uh, had you put thought to that? Or what prompted uh, you to join them? I never could remember um, what really made me feel like I should join the military. But eventually, when I got to that point, I just had a really strong sense of duty and that there was something uh, of a larger purpose than me. Uh, the, earliest memory that I had growing up of thinking about uh, joining the, the military was I think I was in elementary school so I had to be around like eight or seven and uh, I was in the car with my mom and there was a, a radio commercial about the Marines and uh, I, I started asking about it and I said it sounded cool and she said that I could never do it because they carry packs that are well over a hundred pounds and being that young I was like a hundred pounds no one can lift that um, and so that was my earliest memory. Uh, and actually, when I was going through the process of looking what branch I wanted to do, uh, originally I looked into the Army because the Army had a program where the summer before your uh, senior, um, uh, be, being a senior, um, you can go to boot camp and then once you get done with high school, you just go straight into your, your job. And I was like, well, I really want to do this now. Um, but they didn't do it for the infantry. And I always knew that I was gonna go into infantry. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then, so that night when they said no, uh, I went home, I was like, you know what, I think, I think Marines, uh, I, I don't know why, but I was like, I, I think this is a sign because I think I was always supposed to go to the Marines. And so then I'm, from right then and there, I was set on going to the Marines, uh, enrolled in the, the Pooley um, system that they have. And, um, and what's that? It's, a, it's just a, a way to get uh, people that have a year before they're going to boot camp to be engaged, to kind of learn a little bit more about the Marines and the structure. Um, and so you go to functions once a month and you, you work out um, and you learn a little bit about the history, some of the drill, just to make sure okay. you don't kind of just like stray and like, actually, I want to go to college now. They just, you know, they try to yeah, keep you right. there. Yeah, yeah. Um, which I didn't really need that, but it was nice to, to just kind of be in that environment. Then how soon after you graduated from high school did you ship off then for boot camp? I graduated um, on the 17th, and I was at boot camp on the 26th of June. So. And this is what, year uh, 2000? 2006. Six, okay. Yeah, so not too long. Yeah. Um, which, uh, sometimes I kind of kick myself, as much as, I mean, I really wanted to be there right away, but um, when you get to your, your school, so I went to the School of Infantry uh, because they, they start um, the schools or the, the classes when they have enough people. Um, I ended up going to school with people that get to enjoy their summer at home while I enjoyed it at Paris Island. <laughs> um, so it's kind of like, 
Well, I, I kind of got the short end of the deal yeah, right there. Yeah, yeah. When you say school, this was after boot camp? Or? This is after boot camp. Okay, yeah. yeah. And, and how, was, how was that transition going from civilian life, you know, high school senior really when life should be great into, <laughs> in the military life? I mean, did that, that one year program before help you prepare or how was that? Talk uh, about that transition and talk about boot camp. Uh, it, it was definitely just, it was definitely a culture shock. It was not something I don't think anyone can really prepare for. Um, it's just out of this world. Um, and I think a lot of this stuff is a little cliche, the, the standing on the yellow footprints. Uh, I wasn't really like struck with like this emotional feeling. Uh, I really felt it when, uh, so you have to wait for all your clothes. And we're, right when you get there, they send you to this area, you get all your gear, your clothes, and you're waiting there for hours and hours. And uh, they tell you not to lock your knees because then you don't get the blood flowing uh, to your brain because it doesn't circulate and you pass out. And someone did that and he just kind of like, he fell next to me and I was like, oh no, what's, what happened to him? And all the drill instructors just, like there's four of them, they stood around him and they were yelling at him, not really like picking them up or helping him. And I was like, okay, this is something else. This is not <laughs> gonna be a piece of cake. So it's definitely uh, very extreme. Uh, going into that environment uh, but besides that I, I pretty much kind of stayed below the radar didn't get in too much trouble um, so I wasn't being thrashed too hard did you realize I mean you know, the Marines are notorious for every Marine I've ever talked to said they break you down to, to a puddle of clay and then rebuild you could could you see that being that process being done to you or, yeah 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 I could definitely see it um, uh, especially near the end but I've always felt that um, a lot of people like to talk about boot camp, but I really didn't transform until I got into the fleet, which oh, is okay. you know getting into my job. Uh, even after the School of Infantry, uh, I didn't really see, and I, I feel like this happens to everyone, whether they realize it or not, that you don't really uh, learn who you are until you're actually in your job, because um, anyone can try to pretend to be something awesome in boot camp for 13 weeks. Uh, there's a lot of people, the guides, or the leaders of the, the platoon, um, everyone thinks they're outstanding. Uh, but then when they get out of boot camp, uh, they're not really in that environment in which they excelled anymore. And that's when the true leaders come out. And the, those quiet guys that you're like, oh, well, you know, he's, he's not going to be anything big once they get into their job, you realize these are the people that actually know their stuff and they're the ones that are willing to step forward. Wow. Okay, so from boot camp then you went to infantry school? Yep. And and, and you did that by choice? You mm -hmm. requested the infantry school, correct? Yeah. And, um, wh and where was that at? That's in uh, uh, North Carolina. Okay. Uh, it's uh, right outside actually the base that oh, okay. I was uh, stationed at. Um, it's. Uh, New River Air, it's adjacent to New River Air Station, it's Camp Geiger. Um, and they have a few other schools around there too, but it's primarily the School of Infantry. Okay, and how long was that schooling? Uh, it's about, I think, two months. Uh, I graduated boot camp in September, and I finished the School of Infantry at the end of December. So it's about like a month and a half, two months. Okay, and then uh, take your story from there, where'd you go from? Infantry school. Uh, I was stationed at Camp Lejeune, which is uh, adjacent to um, New River Air Station, um, with the First Battalion, Eighth Marines, um, Charlie Company, and that's who I stayed with primarily my entire time in the Marine Corps. I did uh, go to the Weapons Company uh, to train and be with snipers for a little bit, but then I returned back with Charlie Company. Okay. Um, and that's where I did my job as an infantry. Uh, at first, not a leader, but for the most part, um, the entirety of the time I was a team leader. Okay. Okay, so you, you're uh, in your unit now, and, and how long were you in, in uh, Lejeune before you guys, uh, before you had your first tour? Uh, I'd say, uh, let's see, December. I'd say like maybe nine months we trained. We did a workup for, uh, until we went to Iraq. Um, and uh, since I was a new guy, I was uh, trained on the M249 saw, which is a light machine gun. Uh, so I was a saw gunner and I just learned, you know, the basic infantry stuff. And even though the school of infantry, that's what they train you, it's pretty basic. You really don't learn 
the specifics and how to really do your job until you get into the fleet. And who's teaching you and training you is just regular infantry guys. Uh, and it's, it's pretty extraordinary how individuals who aren't trained to be teachers can you know, be able to take on that role. And, uh, and it's really cool to see the different uh, like teaching um, personalities that they have. You always have that guy that's you know, willing to thrash and keep people fit, and then, uh, then you have the really smart guys that will take the time and the patience to train you up on your job and the weapon systems. So you had a combination of that, yeah. of that group? Yeah. 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 So your first tour then was to Iraq, correct? Yes, okay. Ram Ramadi, Iraq. And uh, I was there for seven months. Um, we, our company went to Ramadi and they held a company fob, but our platoon, they uh, trusted us with a great deal of responsibility and so they sent us to hold a compound by ourselves as a platoon. And uh, it was to hold a bridge and do a entry control point into the city. Um, it was on the Euphrates River so it was, uh, it was probably one of my most favorite deployments, just because I was learning so much and uh, I had so much engagement with the locals. Uh, <laughs> um, and I mean, and one of the great things about the infantry is that you, you're given a specific task, but you, you have so many different roles. Uh, there was times that I was guarding the perimeter, other times that I was doing patrols, um, doing the actual checkpoint, uh, training army or uh, police Iraqi forces, um, and then supervising them. So it, it's just, what I really like about it is just having that broad spectrum yeah, of responsibility. Right, right. How was it, uh, uh, particularly taking like the flight over to Iraq when, I know you're sitting in a, I don't know, C-130 or whatever you're flying over in, or, uh, and you've got all these hours to think, and, and you know you're, you're flying in the harm's way. I mean, do you remember that flight over and what you were thinking is, uh, um, at all? Well, you don't really feel it. You have to go to Kuwait first, and then you do a okay. little bit of processing, then you get your ammo and, and whatnot, and then you go into a much larger base in Iraq, and that's when you go... Uh, to you get uh, helicoptered into wherever you're gonna go. And uh, when we were flying over Ramadi, it was at night, and uh, there was police cars, you can see their lights flashing. And our, our platoon commander at the time, he was new, hadn't done a deployment, so he, I mean, he was goofy, and uh, he just didn't know what was going on. And we had some, uh, a lot of my leaders were actually Fallujah vets. They fought in uh, the Battle of Fallujah, so they really know or knew their stuff and they've been through combat. Uh, and so our platoon commander would look out of the window and he would see these lights and he's like, I see tracer rounds, there's firefights everywhere. Uh, and he was making a huge deal out of it. And you could see all the Felicia that's just like looking at each other like, oh boy, this is gonna be a long one. Um, and it was just funny that he just didn't have a clue at that time. Uh, and we joked because when we were doing a training op once, uh, He's, really mo he's a really motivated guy, and uh, at one time he heard uh, pop shots of our, our, insur our training insurgents, um, and we were on a truck, and he just kind of like, he just like ran off the truck by himself, which I mean, platoon commanders shouldn't do, uh, and it was just really goofy, and they were joking about how on the helicopter he would just run off the helicopter and try to get into the fight. Um, so it was a little nerve-wracking, but I mean, it's kind of what war really is. It's this uh, irrational yeah, humor, yeah, right. you know. Uh, everything's really ironic. Uh, it's supposed to be really scary, but really you, you find a dark humor in it. Really, yeah? yeah? Wow. Now, with this guy, this commander being, uh, platoon leader being goofy, did, did you have any doubts about him? Did you have respect for him? Or what, what were you, I mean, um, to add that into the mix, a commander you're not, or a leader you're not quite sure about? It, it was tough. Uh, I, there was a lot of times where you knew he didn't know, any, know anything, but he still presented himself as that, which can get a little dangerous because then he's going to just put it yourself in a, a situation that he thinks he can uh, handle, but he can't. But um, 
we got him on my second deployment, he ended up being our platoon commander again, which isn't really common. Uh, and everyone was like, oh, no, not this guy. But he actually turned out, at that point, you could tell really that he had, um, he had learned from a lot of his mistakes. And that, I, that's when I really respected him. But on the first deployment, it was just kind of like, I hope I don't go on patrol with this guy. Uh, so, um, but besides that, I, I mean, to this day, I, I think everyone in retrospect ends up having a lot of respect for their leaders. Sure. You start uh, figuring out, oh, that's why he did that. Especially once you take on a leadership role, you realize that they were doing things for a certain reason. Uh, so I don't really have any grudges or yeah, sure. bad things to say about yeah, any of my yeah. leaders to include my uh, yeah. platoon commander. What time of year did you guys arrive in? Uh, and Ramadi was the winner. Um, oh, really? And it was really cold. And every time I would get a letter from family or friends, they'd be like, how hot is it? I'm like, well, I know it's a desert, but yeah. it's the winter and it's freezing. And actually, the first time in maybe, I think, 50 years, it snowed for a day. Uh, which was surprising. Wow. And how were, uh, along those lines, how were, you, how were your living conditions as far as uh, where you slept, uh, the food, um, were you properly clothed? I'm assuming, yes. But yeah. <laughs> um, well, so the, the compound that our platoon was in charge of was actually a, um, like a transformer electrical facility that actually took care of electricity for not only Ramadi, but Fallujah and a few other main cities around. Um, so we, at first, we lived on cots um, in between these huge transformer machines. And every time something would go wrong in like, let's say Fallujah, the lights would go out, a huge buzzer would ring off, no matter what time of the night. So you'd get back from patrol and have like four hours of sleep and finally get to bed and like an hour in, this huge buzzer would ring off. And uh, we actually had, Iraqi workers, the people that actually worked there, uh, they were allowed to stay with us and work on this facility because they're the only people that could. And um, you'd always see like two little Iraqis, just as, as soon as the buzzer went off, they'd zip out of their rooms and like start pushing buttons and turning knobs. Uh, and we'd, we would joke, it always seemed that they would turn the same knob always, no matter what <laughs> city was having a problem. So we'd always run over the knob and pretend we were about to turn it for them. They'd be like, no, 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 please don't. Um, <laughs> So it wasn't comfortable, but I think it was unique. It wasn't what a lot of the other people in our company, at least, were uh, living in. Um, they got to have like bunk beds. So eventually, uh, we would kind of form the compound to ours, and we would clean out rooms that were just uh, storing stuff, and we would eventually throw bunk beds in there. So uh, it got comfortable a little bit by the end. Yeah. Well, you, you talked about the, the Iraqi workers in there, and, and I imagine going out on patrols, obviously, you're, you're, you're dealing with the, with the uh, civilians. What was that like? I mean, there were, in that war, there, there was no really, no, there's no front line. I mean, you don't know who's who. I mean, did that play on you at all? I mean, uh, it, you're definitely always hostile to the people you meet, no matter how genuine you think they are. Uh, so it's very difficult. Um, you're always, keeping people away from the patrol. Uh, and since it's a control point to one of the largest cities in Iraq, we had thousands of people going over that bridge a day. Um, so when we would have patrols, whether it's vehicle or on foot, it was uh, a huge responsibility to just keep them away from us and not break the ranks. Um, but eventually, we really warmed up to them. We found out that the vast majority of the Iraqis were good people. Um, they're some of the most respected people from me to them, uh, uh, and I really enjoyed working with them, even though uh, there's plenty of the bad guys we caught within that population. Um, so we, I mean, there's still people we, we couldn't trust, but eventually by the time our deployment went on, uh, we made a lot of friends, uh, shopkeepers uh, specifically, we uh, made relationships with them. We knew we could come to them and get information from them that was reliable uh, and that they would take care of us. And uh, probably the children was my most favorite part of uh, you know, the, the Iraqis over there. They um, really 
it wasn't like they, they didn't trust us. And it's not like because we were bribing them with candy or anything, but they, they really uh, had a lot of fun with us and knew that we weren't going to harm them. Did, did you get to the point uh, over time where you could kind of tell the good from the bad? Or, I mean, uh, Yeah, you can tell who didn't belong there. You can tell whether the way the civilians were, were reacting to them uh, or the way that they were kind of looking at us. Uh, and we always, as soon as we noticed that, we just went straight to them. Uh, and I think that's probably the best tactic is just, just you know, blindside them. Uh, they don't have really, uh, like, they can't react in time. And we either would snatch them up or just question them. And for them to see us as aggressive as that, uh, I, I feel like really saved us because they knew that we were a force to reckon with. We weren't going to let our guard down. Wow. wow. Can, you, can you think of some of the patrols or situations there that stick out in your mind to this day? That, uh, or are they all pretty standard? Or I, imagine? Uh, I mean, there's tons of them. Uh, some of the patrols at night could get a little scary because, like I said, the, the power would go out. And some, sometimes you would be walking through the streets at night and there'd be street lights, uh, but then all of a sudden, uh, bam, the lights would just go out. The entire city would just turn black out. Um, and it was probably one of the most eerie things I've ever seen. And uh, luckily we weren't attacked then, but if I was someone that was trying to attack us, that would be a prime position right there. Um, besides that, pretty standard. Um, I mean, we went through every nook and cranny you can in that city. Uh, we'd search houses. Um, sometimes uh, we'd do a complete census. We'd go door to door, find out who's living there. Uh, that's how we established the, such a good rapport. The people that we relieved, um, they mostly just drove around in armored vehicles, tanks, and they would just drive on by. They never really stopped to talk to the people to see what they needed. Um, and then other patrols, you could tell that we would have missions that just weren't necessary at all. We'd get intelligence that Bin Laden was in the area, we need to go here, or there was 50 insurgents crossing the Euphrates River, or Euphrates River um, and we need to be on the other side of the bank to wait for him. So we'd be on the, that bank for like five hours and we knew no one was going to cross. But uh, it was just someone, I don't know, throwing some intelligence uh, uh, information that was completely wrong for whatever reason. Maybe they got a bag of rice for it or something. Mm -hmm. Now, you said you, you were more in contact with the locals than the, than the guys that you relieved. Mm -hmm. Was that a decision made there on the local level, or was that, did that come down from the higher end, or who, who decided, let's, let's get more involved with these people? I believe it was battalion level. Um, and you, when you get, we get debriefed by the unit before us, and we were hearing that what they were doing, uh, and we were like, that's, that's not how you do it. That's not how you're going to win the fight. And this was during the time when we were really gearing our strategy as a whole, whether it was in, uh, well, actually in Iraq, not in Afghanistan. In Afghanistan, it was soon after, but for the coin operations, uh, really getting down and, and talking to the people and, and helping them establish their own security force. So that was probably the beginning of when those operations started. So it was probably battalion level and also higher up than that. Okay, okay. And then how long were you there on your first tour? Were all the tours the same? Uh, they're like, roughly seven months except for that's right. my last one. Okay. And that's a, is that a normal tour length? I know they, for they, the, the Marine Marines. Corps. The yeah, Marines, okay. uh, they try to do um, seven on and then uh, seven off uh, for their training. Uh, the Army depends on how the unit does it, but they're usually there for like a year. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And what would you guys do when you were back at the base and, and off duty? I mean, what would you do to, to kill time? Uh, a lot of spades, we played card games, uh, but really, so our compound, I mean, we, we had those uh, uh, Iraqi gentlemen that worked in the facility. Uh, some of us hung out with them. Uh, we also had, though, we had the Army, Iraqi Army unit stationed with us. Mm, wow. uh, and then eventually they switched out with the Iraqi police. And we spent an awful amount of time hanging out with them, really. Oh, really? That's yeah. what helped us refine our, our language skills, uh, learn more about the culture, uh, 
who's good, who's bad. Um, and I mean, it differed from whether we were talking to the army or the police, because the police were people who they were locally employed. Uh, the army came out of Baghdad. Um, so you really got two different uh, feelings for how we should conduct ourselves in the population. Mm. Um, but we would play soccer with them, we'd play football with them. Uh, there was a, a, we had a, like a weight room, sometimes they would come and try to lift weights, and it was just pretty funny, because usually it's the bar and they can't even lift that. <laughs> um, so, I mean, that's basically what we did, was just sleep, hang out with them, and uh, play cards. Could you, could you let your guard down with those guys? I mean, was it was it still kind of we, a... It was still a little iffy, especially, uh, I mean, that's when, uh, at least in Iraq, the, the blue on blue, the uh, some people would uh, get into the Iraqi army with the or the police with the sole mission to turn on right, us. Right. Um, so you never really, some people did turn there, were, felt very comfortable, and we didn't have any issues. So, I mean, I guess they had every reason to, but at least for me, I, I wasn't comfortable enough, comfortable enough to fully have my guard down uh, with them. But I mean, I did have a lot of good friends. There was, uh, they didn't always have to go on patrol with us. Um, and they, they're supposed to rotate, but there was a few individual Iraqi army soldiers uh, who really believed in the cause to yeah, be able to uh, help out their, their own citizens. And so we made good friends with those guys, the guys that always went on patrol with us. Uh, and the, the guys that really knew the English um, used them pretty much as uh, interpreters okay. when we couldn't use our, our own. And how comfortable were you with the language? I mean, how, did, how much did you pick up? Uh, I was pretty good. Oh, really? uh, I was uh, actually awarded a certificate of accommodation for my language skills wow. on my first deployment. Um, I really enjoyed engaging with the population and, uh, and I felt like they, they trust you more when they see that you'll take the time out of your, your, your schedule, whether it was while you're on deployment or even before then, to learn the language. Uh, they really do respect that. How about uh, communications back home? Were you guys set up with uh, Skype or internet access, computer access the there? The last month, they finally got us uh, computers and phones. A month or two, I think. Um, and we couldn't Skype, but we could get like an instant message email. But by then, a lot of us uh, were just so used to only doing mail wow. uh, that we, we kind of just wanted to you know, stay in our own schedule uh, and stay focused on the mission, especially since uh, that being close to that com comfort and communication can make you complacent and lose focus on the job. So at least for me, I, I stayed away from the computers uh, only to like send a, an email yeah. every now and then. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but besides that, be or before that, it was just mail. And sometimes we can go to uh, the larger base, Camp Ramadi, use the computers, but that was, there was no need to do that once we uh, got the computers at our, our little fob. How, how was it with, with just in communication in general? I mean, were you isolated enough or, or did you get what was going on back home, what was going on in the world, uh, Red Sox scores? I mean, what kind of... Oh, I mean, yeah. Yeah, we, we had a pretty good idea, especially since, uh, I mean, since there's, it was a city, the uh, Iraqis actually had television. Yeah. They even had internet themselves. so. Uh, the Iraqi workers that lived with us, they would have their TV and they would have the, the BBC or Al Jazeera. Um, so we could see like world events, um, scores for uh, sports games. Uh, I think there's a few guys that got to go to Camp Ramadi for like the Super Bowl. Um, so it, I mean, we, we had a pretty good idea. We had uh, some strong connection with the outside world. And lastly, in regards to living conditions, how was uh, food and, and uh, hygiene and, and, and such just general living conditions there? Well, for that first deployment, um, the food, we actually were close enough to Camp Ramadi where they could truck out uh, two warm hot deals or meals a day um, and then just have like an MRE for lunch. Uh, and then for showering, We'd have to, we'd get like a shower, I don't know, twice a month. We'd, whenever we get a chance to go back to Camp Ramadi, 
Uh, we do have shower bags, but sometimes it's just too cold to really? use those. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, and eventually, we tried. Uh, so we had funds to buy stuff from uh, the local markets and whatnot, huh? and we tried uh, getting a, a hot water heater um, from the Iraqis, but I don't think we got that working, especially since uh, a lot of their, their containers for the water has to be on the roof because they don't have pumps. They have to uh, work with gravity in order to get the water. Right, so yeah, yeah. we would have to fill that up with water. We'd have to get you know so many bottles of water just to fill it up, just yeah. to take a shower. Yeah, yeah. And it was really more effort than right, right. you wanted to do just to you know, be clean. So that first tour was uh, fairly uh, normal. I mean, who were any uh, was the compound ever attacked, or was it was it a pretty? It was uh, pretty quiet. quiet uh, I we like I like I said, they uh, we were pretty aggressive, so um, the enemy didn't necessarily take too many advantages to attack us. They mostly attacked the civilians. We had a few kidnappings. Uh, there is one. Uh, I want to say it was a restaurant. What? Could have been a shop. Uh, it was attacked with uh, um, an SFAS, the suicide bomber. Um, and then uh, we found a few IEDs. But for the most part, um, it, it was pretty calm. Uh, they, the, the, there was a, a pretty big battle before we got there. It was the Battle of Donkey Island, um, where 50 and it was a very large and cohesive uh, unit for that far into the war. Um, 50 insurgents, um, and they failed at their their mission to attack a, uh, I believe it was an, an army unit. And that pretty much uh, threw a wrench in the insurgents' activities in that area, at least. Okay. Um, so it was pretty quiet on that deployment. Yeah. So how was it, uh, once again, I uh, imagine growing up, I don't know how far away you traveled, how much traveling you did growing up, but now you're in this foreign land. What was that like to be a, I mean, a totally, totally different environment? I mean, it was, uh, it was pretty incredible. I mean, that was the first time I left the country, so um, it, it was pretty cool to just to see how different it was. And also to, to kind of get a, rid of a lot of the stereotypes, just to, to see that these people, you know, they're not bad. Just because they have a different religion, uh, they live a different way, doesn't mean they're, they're all evil. Yeah. Um, so it was really cool to not only learn about a culture, but to really be involved in it and uh, experience it. Oh, very cool. Well, is there anything on, on this first tour that, or, that we left out that you want to talk about? Um, uh, I mean, I guess the last thing is just, uh, I think it, being involved with that civilian population, uh, it was very touching. And uh, before we left, when we were, uh, getting our, our bags ready to go uh, and, and leave to Camp Ramadi to then go home, uh, a lot of the people we worked with and even like the civilians around the area were crying. Really? Uh, and we're like, well, why are you crying? Like, well, you're leaving. Uh, and we're like, well, don't worry. There's Marines taking our place. You're still going to be safe. Uh, but they're like, no, 1-8 is leaving. And they really uh, were touched by what we could do for them. Um, and they insisted that they put our bags on the truck. They wouldn't allow us to, to touch them. So uh, it was just, it was definitely a turning point in the sense that you didn't realize you were doing that much yeah. good. You yeah. didn't realize you were doing so much for them until they really showed their gratitude wow. at that point. And uh, I mean, hopefully one day it gets uh, safe enough to, you know, maybe visit there and see some of the people that I was able to, to meet. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm -hmm. So uh, you returned back uh, after the first tour, um, and then what, another seven months back at Lejeune then? Or where, take your story from uh, returning back from that first tour. Um, so I think it was longer than seven months. We got back um, and we just kind of settled down. We knew that, we didn't know if we were going to go back to Iraq or, or if we were going to go to Afghanistan. It turned out to be Iraq again. So it, it just turned out to be a little bit longer. I think uh, I um, we got back, let's see, I think it was almost a year. I can't really remember, but yeah, uh, that's fair. Um, so, I mean, since I did a pump, I, was, I became a team leader. I get to train Marines now, um, and I, I really did enjoy that. 
but I also had, uh, I, I really wanted to be in like either special forces or uh, be with the snipers. And eventually I actually went to snipers um, and I trained with them for a little bit. Um, that's pretty tough training from what I understand. Yeah, it's, it's really tough training. I mean, some of the stuff that they do is it's incredible and it's not even just physical um, uh, training. It's also being smart, right. uh, keen. Uh, a lot of the things that they do involve uh, pretty, pretty um, uh, like difficult equations. And a lot of this has to be done and thought of within like a matter of seconds. Um, and so I trained with them for a little bit and eventually I realized that what I wanted to do was be a, a infantry team leader because uh, I wouldn't have been a team leader at that point if I finished my uh, sniper school and deployed with them. Uh, and it would be, I think it would have been, you know, an interesting experience to do that, but I realized that I, I like to teach a lot more, I like to lead. Um, and so I asked to go back to my parent unit, uh, 1-H Charlie Company, and then I became a team leader and trained Marines to go to Iraq. Some, some of your old guys you served with, or was it? What it was the same guys, same platoon. I was fortunate enough that they allowed me to go back to my platoon. Some of the times when that happens, they uh, send you to a different company. Whoever needs the, yeah. uh, the people will get uh, the extra people, but uh, I was able to make a deal where I got to go back to my platoon, which I was very happy for, because not only did I get to work with the guys that I deployed with before, but um, they, I had uh, already kind of talked and trained some of the younger guys, and so I wanted to continue where I left. Excellent. So you're back there, and, and then uh, you guys, roughly a year later, deploy again back to Iraq, mm -hmm. correct? Okay. Talk about that. that uh, this time we deployed to uh, Habania, Iraq, um, it, and we worked out of the large base uh, Al Takedum, and we basically did security for them. We, uh, at least our, our company, well, the battalion was split up in two, so there was only two companies at this base, uh, and so our company we were either watching the main gates of the base or one of the main gates to the base uh, and then doing security patrols. Um, that was a relatively quiet uh, deployment as well. Uh, we did have to respond to um, a suicide bomber tried attacking one of the, the Air Force compounds. Um, so we just had to uh, you know, respond to that, which was interesting because the second we got there, it was already on the news. Uh, it had been posted, I, I guess one of the news companies uh, had an informant. I, wanna, I don't want to say informant because that yeah. seems a little uh, like evil, but <laughs> there's an Iraqi on the base that gets paid you know, to you know, post them about things that happen right away, and by the time we got there, it was already on the news. So it's kind of uh, interesting how fast that works these days. Um, it took a few rocket attacks, mortar attacks, but that's about it. It was uh, pretty quiet. Uh, that's about the point when uh, we started pulling our troops back in Iraq to uh, larger bases in the cities and taking them out of the rural areas. Uh, the mindset behind that was there's no point in sending our troops into harm's way um, if there's nothing to defend out there. There's no reason to mm. keep them in the rural mm -hmm. areas. Um, and so that's when we started uh, to draw down troops in Iraq. Did you have uh, the same civilian interaction on this tour that you did the, the previous one? Not exactly, because we didn't live amongst them. Uh -huh. uh, and this is actually a point where they uh, were deciding to take away um, immunity for soldiers. So if a soldier or a Marine got in trouble according to our Iraqi laws, there was a chance that the police could uh, put them in jail. Uh, and so it was a very iffy gray area at that point. So we tried not to stay too long in the, in the, in the cities. Um, and also we just didn't, we didn't live with them. Uh, they, it was a different uh, type of people. Um, they were a little bit more conservative Muslim. So 
they were a little bit more. It was a different sect, the us. Sunni versus uh, or the it Shiites, was, or it was still a mixture, whether oh, okay. it was in Ramadi or Habaniya, um, but they seemed a little bit more conservative and weary to work with us. Um, we uh, tried to engage with them and have conversations with some of the the elders, and they they just did not hmm. want to be a part of it. Well, in Ramadi, they they were very eager, um, and. Even though it was two cities, it, it was just, you can definitely tell there's a different demographic there. Hmm. And how long, once again, this tour was seven months? Seven months. Okay, mm -hmm. okay. And how were uh, living conditions there on that compound? Uh, really nice. Since it was a large base, we got to live in, uh, we call them cans, and that's basically their conix boxes. And uh, they have, uh, you know, they have regular beds. They have, you can get internet in them if you want to pay. So it, it was a very cozy one, um, and uh, I, was, I was a little bit weary about it because I knew the guys that I had trained, the new guys, would go on the next deployment and not really know some of the tough conditions that we had in Ramadi. Um, so it, it was tough to try to keep them motivated, to not make them complacent, because, um, I mean, still something could sneak by and, and happen. Uh, I think during that time is when uh, uh, on a different base, I think it was an Air Force base, a couple insurgents scaled the wall and, and started shooting at people while they were going to the showers. So, I mean, it, there was always this, this battle to make sure our Marines were complacent even though there wasn't too much going on. Yeah, right, oh boy. What time of year were you over on this, during this set? Uh... This was the summer, so it was really hot. <laughs> so it was actually really nice to have sort of a comfort living so you can have, you know, some air conditioning. Um, uh, and you know, just not die of like heat stroke. Yeah, how do, that's something I've always been uh, wondering about. I mean, you, you, you see uh, news reports, middle of the summer, and you guys are loaded down to the tilt with equipment and, and flak jackets. And I mean, was it, I mean, how did you keep cool out on out on a patrol like that? You just conditioning. Really? You yeah. just you really gotta tough it out. Um, uh, I always had a uh, uh, a head wrap an Iraqi head wrap and what you do with those you put around your neck and you just soak it with water and it'll keep you cool but it's basically just conditioning and also hydration if you're wow. not hydrated you'll go down pretty quick wow. um, and I know a lot of stories of uh, during firefights people had to get medevac not because they were shot or, or anything but because they were going through heat stroke because they would be in a battle for so long and they wouldn't have any water so heat is definitely uh, one of the worst enemies that you can have. Yeah, I can imagine, you know, growing up in, in uh, Connecticut, you hadn't experienced any heat like yeah. that before. I don't imagine Which, anybody's experienced a heat like that. Yeah, and uh, in Ramadi, because it was so cold, uh, I would complain about the cold and be like, well, you're from Connecticut, it, aren't you used to it? It's like, well, the thing is, when you live in Connecticut, you stay indoors, <laughs> and the only time you go outside is yeah. to your car, and then you heat up your car. So. Uh, I always thought it was funny that people were like, you're supposed to be used to the cold. I'm like, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, uh, we kind of quickly went over the second uh, yeah. tour. Is there anything else in the, that you can think of? It was, of? yeah. The, I mean, the second tour, it was, uh, it breezed by, by very quickly. Um, uh, and it wasn't too difficult. I, I Actually, I had gotten married to my wife before that deployment. Oh, wow. Well, we'll, have to go um, back and we'll have to talk about that then. Yeah. yeah. So it was our first deployment separated, but we did have like Skype and whatnot, so that made it easier, but um, it, it was a little difficult. So you knew her time. through your first deployment? No, not oh. through, I okay. met her after my, okay. uh, my first deployment. Okay. Um, uh, she was on vacation uh, to um, Topsail Island, which is an island right si outside of the, the base I was stationed at, and uh, I just happened be in the area for my one of my senior Marines was having uh, a party because he was getting out of service and uh, we just bumped into each other she lives uh, she was living in Pennsylvania so uh, the next time I went up to Connecticut to go home we we're like let's meet up and since then we we hit it up yeah I'll be there wow wow yeah so I mean that so that made for a, a certainly a different tour than the first one having somebody at home that you were that you cared about well aside from yeah. family but I mean having a loved one and I don't know, did that make that any easier or any, any, any um, harder or, or was? It, it was definitely uh, harder. I think it was uh, hard for her. I mean, she's never in a relationship like that. Um, 
and I was definitely more engaged with home, with more engaged with you know trying to speak with her almost every day. She was uh, actually teaching English in Chile while I was on deployment to kind oh, of wow. keep her preoccupied. Yeah, so uh, we were kind of like on our own little deployments. Yeah. Um, so it was tough because she can always use the computer. I, I mean, I couldn't always use the computer. Um, but it definitely, I mean, even with family, you, you don't want to get hurt or you don't want to get killed because you, know, you would really, you know, it would be horrible for them. But when you get married and you start making a closer family, um, uh, you definitely feel like I would really hate to, yeah. I don't want to say like disappoint, yeah. but you know, yeah, there's yeah, yeah. just a lot more to lose. Right. And, and have, have, since then or after uh, deployments, did either your wife or your sister or aunt and uncle or mother ever talk about what they were feeling on the other side? I mean, with you over there, uh, uh, did they ever talk about their feelings about the worry or... Oh yeah, all the time, and uh, my uh, aunt and uncle, they, they kept a, a, a um, yellow ribbon on their tree all the way up uh, to the point wow. that I, I retired out of the, the Marines. Um, and they always talked about how they would worry, and uh, for when I went to Afghanistan, I actually had to extend. Um, I didn't re-enlist, uh, and I, I was supposed to get out, but the reason why I went was, like I said, my Marines had a pretty comfy uh, uh, deployment and I they were prepared they knew what they were doing but I just felt like I could really help out oh, wow. uh, if I extended it went to Afghanistan and helped them train their newer Marines wow. um, so that kind of put a lot of worry on my my wife and family uh, they didn't obviously want me to extend but I, I kind of pushed through it yeah, I'll be darn. Wow. wow so you were close to your guys obviously I mean, yeah. you cared for these guys huh? mm -hmm. yeah wow so then, uh, so you're back from your second one. What was the gap of time then before uh, then you deployed for uh, it Afghanistan? Was, it was pretty short. It was, I think, roughly around six or seven months. Um, it felt short, at least. Uh, um, we got back. It, it seemed there's always a lot of focus, even in like the national media or the national conversation on Iraq. Uh, Afghanistan has always kind of disappeared into yeah. the shadows. And so um, this is 1-8's first time going to Afghanistan, and we knew that it was going to be a lot more dangerous than Iraq. And so we really got serious when it came time for this. And that, I, at this point, they weren't letting anyone extend or really re-enlist at this point. Uh, there was a group of us that had to fight to extend um, to go on this deployment. Uh, we had to get uh, a few commanding generals permission. Really? Wow. Um, and on the, it, by letting us extend, we couldn't re-enlist um, ever again. They was like, you, you, we'll let you do this, but you have to get out. Uh, so, I mean, a lot of us really fought to do this deployment, and we really took it seriously. Uh, our training was pretty intense. Um, we had to learn a completely, not only a completely different language, but two different languages, because where we were going, they taught two different dialects. Um, and obviously that must be easier. Languages are easier for you to pick up, it sounds like, or? Yeah, yeah. Um, and I, I've forgotten a lot of it now, but if I feel like if I sat down and actually yeah. Yeah. Uh, remind myself, I, I could probably get down pat. Um, but yeah, so it was definitely a more intensive uh, training regimen. Um, but it, it seemed like we didn't do enough training at that point. We need, I always felt like we had to keep doing more. I always had, uh, on our downtime, uh, when, we're, when we weren't doing training ops, I would pull the guys out and go to uh, the quad, uh, this big grassy area, and I would have them doing infantry uh, strategies and uh, maneuvering. We'd always be clearing rooms out. Whatever time we had, we were always trying to train. Wow, wow. Now you mentioned that it was, uh, you, you had to fight to get that extension, but you couldn't uh, re-enlist. Had you ever thought at any point of making it a career, or were, you, were your plans just to do a, an enlistment, get out, and move on with life? Uh, um, before I joined, I was like, I'm gonna do eight years. Um, and I'm not really sure where I got that from, because I had no, no, no idea what the military was yeah. like. Uh, but when you get in, especially with the, the infantry, uh, it can get a little discouraging, because um, you, you get the bureaucratics and you just, 
you, you don't really, you love your job, but when it comes to the administrative proportion, you, you get, um, you know, just thrown around, you, you get the short end of the deal. Um, and so a lot of people, a lot of good guys end up getting out because they're like, this is just not fair, whether it's with promotions or just being told to do things that they really aren't necessary. Um, uh, so I got to a point where it's like, uh, I, I could see myself getting out, but then we, we got wind that we were going to Afghanistan. I was like, well, I, I, I think I should do this one. Um, so your initial enlistment was four years? Or? Four years. Okay. Mm -hmm. And any reserve requirements after that, or just a uh, They always say that you have to do um, four years inactive reserve after that, because I did the that pool function. Um, that took a year off of that, oh, okay. so it was only three. Um, but then I did the extension, which knocked out, well, would have knocked out two, but it turned out to be two, uh, or one year, but then turned out to be two more. So my inactive reserve came to be one year. Okay, and and when you when you got that extension, uh, obviously I'm sure your wife didn't want you to do it. Yeah, was, was she able to understand why you felt you needed to do that? I mean, did you ever obviously get was, turned around on it or? Uh, I was pretty stubborn on it. Uh, she always didn't want me to go, and probably to this day, is like, uh, yeah, I don't really get why he did that. <laughs> it was a little selfish of me to do. Um, it, it was selfish for me to do something that was selfless, as, I mean, for my guys. Uh, and it's weird, you always have to try to find a balance when you're, you're married in the sure. military. Yeah. Uh, a lot of guys have to go through that, and it, there's never a point where you can be like, well, this is more important yeah. than my relationship with my wife. Right. It just has to come down to, this is what I'm doing. Uh, and. Thankfully, I mean, I'm back here to enjoy my relationship yeah, right, with my wife. Yeah, right, sure. Um, and it's, it's just one of those speed bumps that I, all marriages go through. Mine's just a little bit more unique yeah. than uh, some others. Yeah, right, right. So uh, let's, let's talk about this third, this third tour then. So you're off to Afghanistan. How was, uh, was it the same sort of uh, setup where you stopped in Kuwait and, and uh, got acclimated or talk, take your, take uh, your uh, trip? We stopped in... Kazakhstan, I think it's pronounced, uh, and we stayed there for, it feels like weeks, but it's really just a few days, because you really, especially for Afghanistan, I mean, everyone at that point wanted to go to Afghanistan, that's where the fight was, uh, it's like the wild, wild west, yeah. and uh, so you're just, you're sitting there waiting for a flight, and all the flights are, are taken, um, and and it, what's more, it's more unique than the Kuwait uh, base, because uh, this base was housing all the NATO troops, so you would see oh, people wow. from different countries sharing the same rooms, and it's just really cool to see like such a, a, a you know unique group of people uh, all going for the same purpose. Um, and then uh, eventually we got a flight and we flew into uh, Camp Leatherneck, which is in Helmand Province. Uh, we stayed there for a little bit. Um, we got our ammo there, getting acclimated, um, and we basically just sat around waiting for another flight, which those uh, are more few and far in between because their resources are going out to, you know, for combat, uh, medevacs, um, you know, just getting supplies out there. So we had to wait a little bit longer. Um, and you could really feel the sense of uh, danger um, behind where the hut that we were staying at, um, they shot rockets, they're called High Myers. Um, and a unit that would be adjacent to us, 3-5, they're, they're down in Sangin, uh, having a lot of difficulty, and they would shoot off 13 rockets at a time uh, in, in a firefight, because they were having uh, such difficulty down there with the insurgency. Wow. So you could really get that, that sense of uh, the danger that we were about to face. And how did you feel about that? Was it Anxiety, anxious to get into the fight, or I, 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 I'm asking this question from a from a perspective of someone that's never anywhere been near anywhere a battle <laughs> condition. So I don't know what I'm just trying to understand what a what goes through a person's mind in, in a situation. We were pretty anxious. Um, we really wanted to get in the fight, especially knowing that there was Marines out there that needed help. Um, uh, there's always uh, a casualty every day. Um, 
when there's a casualty within the area, it's called um, River City, and all communication is uh, shut down between us and home. So the computers are locked out, the phones are locked out, and so not only are you sitting around doing nothing, you can't even go to the, the phone center and, and talk to your family, yeah. uh, but you knew that you know there's something going on out there and you wanted to be a part of it. So um, you were doing nothing, not talking to your family, and then doing nothing and not helping out. Yeah, right, right, right. So then uh, you went from camp, and then you guys went out to a fire base, or where did you go from where you guys initially came in at? Um, we helicoptered into uh, uh, it's a base called Cafaretta, um, is in uh, a city called Nauzat, in northern Helmand province. Um, and that's where my company was going to stay. And once again, they, uh, they had our platoon. And I've been in the same platoon this whole time. They've always uh, held a lot of respect for our platoon. Our platoon, uh, I wasn't with them. But when, they, we, uh, when there was war going on in Lebanon uh, in, uh, I believe, 2006 or 2007, um, they called on second platoon to get all our evacuees, um, American evacuees, uh, out of Lebanon. Oh wow! Um, so the, we've always had a lot of responsibility as a platoon. So they sent our platoon um, to uh, a, a small little uh, forward operating base, a patrol base, uh, in a in a town called Dahana, and then they sent another platoon uh, up uh, to the north of Cafaretta. So there was two platoons outside of Cafaretta, and the rest of the company was in Cafaretta. And, and what was the compound like there? Uh, it was a pretty fortified compound. In Afghanistan, the walls are probably 18 inches thick of mud, and they can take a hit. Um, uh, and it was a police station. We had the, the police staying there and uh, the army. So we had one, one corner had the, the police there and the other corner had the army there. And then in the middle was our, our platoon's uh, area. And uh, we were actually renting it from someone who owned the property, which I, I thought was a little ironic in war that we were <laughs> renting a property. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it, it was, uh, I mean, it was basically a mud house that we'd stayed in and with huge walls around it. Wow. wow. And how was it, uh, once again, an entirely different people and, um, what was your comfort level there, mingling with the, the uh, Afghan police and the, and the military? I mean, um, well, at that point, uh, I, I was very much a senior uh, Marine, and I was still leading uh, a team, but most of the time I took out like a squad size element. Uh, so I was very, um, very serious about what I was doing, and I actually I didn't interact with the population that much because I didn't trust them at all. In fact, the first day we got there, um, we were talking with the, the guys that we were um, relieving, and um, we took a rocket, and um, and I was like, okay, this is this is it. This is how they're introducing themselves. This is, I mean, this is yeah. basically what our deployment is, um, and they and they told me, hey, get a few guys out. We're going out there to get them. Uh, um, uh, so we ran to the roof and. Uh, we had one guy, we were leaving one too, he was running to get the machine gun ready, um, and then one of our guys was going, and they shot another rocket and went right in between them. Uh, and so we had like two huge holes in our wall, but uh, it was definitely one hell of a way to, to start the deployment. Um, and uh, so from there on, I, I didn't really trust the population. They didn't want to interact with them. I knew that a lot of them were just going to lie to me. Uh, a lot of them I was probably going to fight. So it was definitely a complete 180 from how I was with the, the Iraqis and Ramadi. I've got to imagine too, it was a complete 180 or an additional, this tour was quite a bit different than the other two in, in the respect that, I mean, you're still under the stress of war, but now you've got the additional stress that you got responsibility for some men. Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, that, I can't imagine what the, the stress level that must have been knowing that, you know, you had to take care of your men, and yeah. you know a wrong decision could get somebody hurt or yeah. killed. I mean that uh, that's incredible stress mm -hmm. for, quite frankly, yeah. a young kid. I mean for anybody, but uh, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, and uh, I led a, uh, for the most part, a designated marksman team. I had a uh, a sniper rifle, a Mark 12, and so a lot of times I was doing uh, Overwatch for guys that uh, I would be up in the mountains and we'd have guys patrol. 
uh, and one of our tactics was um, get him, get the enemy out. I mean, this is, I mean, totally different mission. As much as we wanted to engage with the population uh, and, and help them out with some of the problems that they had, uh, the towns that we were taking care of, they were pretty far apart. So it's really hard to keep the Taliban out. We'd leave, they'd come back in. Um, and so a lot of what we did was just straight combat. That was our mission, was to find the enemy, seek him out, and take care of him. Um, so eventually, and the way that we had it was, uh, we'd have our base, and there'd be a, a large wadi or dry riverbed, and then there'd be this huge valley, uh, and then it would end at another dry riverbed, and on the other side of that was a known enemy town. I mean, we knew the enemy was there, um, and it was almost like a football field. We would come out onto the field, and then they would come out onto the field. And uh, we eventually knew that they would do that, so what we do, we kind of have bait. We'd send a patrol out there and they'd just walk around and we'd see them set up on the sides of compounds and uh, my team would take them out. Wow, wow, wow. What time of year were you over in Afghan? The was winter, so it was, it was cold. <laughs> extremely cold. Yeah. 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 Uh, although, so we got there in the fall and then left in the beginning of spring. And it was pretty hot during those periods, um, but it was very cold and wet uh, during that time in the, the middle. And it sounded like uh, living conditions there were pretty primitive in comparison to your other two uh, deployments. Yeah, um, we did have cots, but uh, it was much dirtier. Uh, I mean, the complete, the whole entire place was made of mud or some sort of cement. Um, what I lived next to was a, a, a window that used to be a window. It was a huge gaping hole, uh, so I had to board it up myself. Um, but we definitely made it home. Uh, we, we made like little shelves and, and doors and uh, I mean, we, we did a pretty good job building that, that place up. Well, during, during that time, would you ever get pulled back for, you know, I guess a rough R&R &R back to a larger camp? I mean, did you get breaks in that or were you out um, in the field the whole time? We'd get a chance to uh, go back to Cafaretta. Um, we wrote, our, our uh, squads would rotate. Uh, so I'd say twice a month I would be able to get to Cafaretta and get a shower, um, you know, send a quick email, maybe uh, get some laundry done, uh, grab the mail, and then we'd go back. Uh, and that's about it. Uh, it was definitely probably the most uh, uh, like worst conditions of all the deployments. Um, which, I mean, I was fine with. I mean, that's, that's what I live for, yeah. right there. Yeah. yeah. And you made it back uh, with uh, all you guys? Uh, you... I was the only casualty. Oh. Um, I was, uh, by the fifth month, I was struck by, my vehicle was struck by a, uh, a roadside bomb. Oh, um, geez. We had, uh, we had a few operations um, to uh, take a few towns, but they, because of intelligence got leaked, we had to cank them. And one of the towns that we were going to take, uh, it was completely vacant. No one was living there. The Taliban had, you know, gotten them all out. Uh, and we were going to take that the day, the day prior. And word got out that this operation was going to happen. So they had laid all the roads with IEDs for the most part. Um, and so it got canceled, but they're like, we want to do a patrol. Um, we want you to escort. Uh, an intelligence team, uh, and then a team that also trained the Afghani police uh, to the town adjacent to it. Um, so we did that, but then we came back through this other town we were supposed to go and take the day prior. Um, we started taking uh, mortar fire in our uh, convoy, and we, then we ended up, or before that we got intel, hey, they, there's an ambush waiting for you. We, uh, we received their radio transmissions. We have a rough idea where they are. Um, so we're like, OK, if they want to go, we can go. So we're going straight to the ambush. Um, but unfortunately, we got stuck in a choke point. And the way the IED was set up was uh, it was designed as a, like a very hard bolt. So the first vehicle can drive over it, break it, and then the second vehicle would set it off. And I was in the second vehicle. and. Um, the blast, it shattered bones in my feet. Um, and so now I have a metal plate in my heel and I, I can't run anymore because uh, the wow. joints kind of fused. Yeah. Oh, wow. Um, so I was the only casualty of 
that deployment. And were you medevaced out? I mean, did that end your deployment, or were you patched they up? Ended and put it. Uh, I, I was medevaced that night, um, and I ended up uh, at um, Bastion, the hospital there, and uh, then I was sent to Germany for a day or two, and then they sent me back to the States. Oh, wow. Oh, geez. That, that uh, phone call or message into your wife um, must have been, how did, that, how did no. she hear about well, it? Well, so the, the commanding officer is supposed to make that phone call, and he told me he would, and I don't know what happened to this day, but he didn't make the call. So when I ended up, uh, when I made it to Bastion, uh, the next day, they gave me a satellite phone. It's like, or you can, you know, call your loved ones. And so I assumed, sure, I knew. And when I called her, uh, it was nighttime there, and she was uh, actually out having fun with friends, uh, enjoying herself. And I, when she answered the phone, I was like, hey, how's it going? And she seemed like, you know, having the most fun in the world. She was <laughs> excited to get a call yeah, from me. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, oh, she doesn't know. Uh. And so it was very difficult to, you know, to tell her that, you know, I got hurt. Wow. How long were you uh, uh, in the hospital, or how long did it take to, to um, recover? I was uh, at Bethesda, Maryland, the, the main hospital there for, I want to say, uh, al almost a month. And I had to be in a wheelchair. Um, and eventually I got moved to crutches. But they allowed me to go home in a wheelchair uh, for a, a little bit and then fly back to Bethesda for my main uh, appointments. So I'd say I was in a wheelchair for two months and then I was in crutches from there. Uh, and then um, probably after three months I was able to get the, the cast off my foot. Wow, oh geez. Did you ever get a chance to go back and meet up with your men once they'd come yeah, back? Yeah, I have returned to 1-8, uh, uh, second platoon and um, uh, I pretty much kind of like sat around. They were getting ready for the next deployment for Afghanistan, and uh, I was, I, you had to wait a certain amount of time, six months from when you were wounded to be on a medical board. Um, and then a medical board to be medically retired takes a really long time. I know some guys that have been on it for two years, so they kind of sit around doing nothing for two years because they're not fit to do their job. Um, Which you wouldn't have been, I would imagine. Not for infantry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I helped train, you know, just give classes to some of the guys, um, but eventually I got moved. They asked me to uh, help run their casualty uh, center because they're going back to Afghanistan. And so there needs to be guys here to help track our guys who get wounded like they did for me, and then also uh, help track those who get killed and um, uh, be able to, and depending on how far we have to go, uh, we would give the bad news to those families oh, and boy. attend their funerals. Um, and so I did that for a little bit until I was medically uh, retired. And that was this, this last April, you said? When yeah, I was able to leave uh, in April. Yeah. Yeah. How, was, uh, how was that transition after all you, you know, your, uh, your career and after everything you've been through, how was that, I guess the opposite of the question I asked you in the beginning, going from a military life back now to civilian life? Uh, I mean, it was difficult, uh, especially because uh, it wasn't just, you know, because I came from the military. I mean, I, I deal with uh, PTSD and uh, my injuries. And um, so, and I didn't go straight. I, I started school in the fall, so I was able to have the summer to kind of just, you know, relax, um, get a feel for four columns. Uh, I mean, I, I joined the military from Connecticut. I came out here because my wife is doing grad school at CSU. Okay. So I really didn't know anything about this town. You know, yeah. it's, it's such a, a beautiful town. So I was able to, you know, at least go camping uh, and, and go to a few concerts. Um, but uh, it, it was difficult. I, a lot of things that I'd like to do involve, you know, being able to run or, or something like that. Um, and so it, it, it was tough yeah. transitioning. Yeah. And, uh, and so I've been, since then, I've been trying to get involved with a lot of organizations that deal with veterans' issues to try to um, just keep my mind yeah. off of all that stuff. 
Are you getting uh, treatment for your PTSD? Yep. Yeah. Uh, okay. I go to the vet center. It's a it's a great place. Okay. Uh, so you're, you're well taken care of in mm -hmm. that regard. Okay. Yeah. Good. good. We'll talk a little bit about um, your future now, or your present and uh, your future plans. I know we're, it's just a short gap, but uh, not a whole lot to fill in between now and since then. But what are your what are your what are your future plans? Um, well, I, I want to finish school. I'm getting a degree in uh, political science. I, I'd really like to uh, be involved in government policy. Um, and uh, here on campus at Front Range, I'm the president of the student veterans group. Um, and I'm also the social media chair for Veterans Passport to Hope, which is a uh, nonprofit organization that helps uh, create awareness of veterans issues and then also consolidate other organizations so we don't have veterans getting lost in the sauce, uh, if you will, yeah. uh, trying to figure out how, what support they can get or if it's out there. Um, and so I plan to continue doing that and then uh, hopefully get in a position in government. Well, excellent. What are your thoughts, uh, since you're on the ground in both these countries, uh, what are your thoughts on the wars that we fought there, the, the present situations, their futures, uh, give a, a truly better perspective than us back here in the States on what, what's going on there from, from your viewpoint? Um, well, I've always felt, I don't believe that these wars were, or at least Iraq was completely justified, uh, but I, I always felt like uh, it is a war that should have been fought. Um, I believe that, you know, there's so many people out there being oppressed and there needs to be someone um, to do something about it. Uh, and unfortunately, sometimes it has to be America. Um, and Iraq is done and over with, and I hope that uh, they continue to hold their government. It's having a little difficult, uh, difficulty right now, um, but I really do hope that they can to hold it. Uh, Afghanistan, they're just getting to the stages of kind of where my second deployment was. They're, they're winding down, they're bringing people back to the cities. Uh, but that's, it's going to have a lot more difficulty. Uh, it's, it's probably going to see chaos as soon as we leave. Um, and I mean, I hope the best for it. I mean, I've lost guys over there. Actually, uh, two of the Marines that I trained and went to Afghanistan with the first time, they didn't make it back on their, that second deployment. Uh, so I really don't want them to live in vain. Um, yeah. uh, and. Uh, I mean, I, I really, I think there is potential that it can hold it together when we pull out. Uh, I watched a, a documentary on some of uh, the, lo the locals are now really trying to grab hold of their security themselves. They're creating their own militias and it's not like, it's kind of like what you had uh, when the Russians were over in Afghanistan. You had the Taliban, but then you had the Mujahideen. Right. Um, and now you're starting to see that. Uh, and it's not as established as the Mujahideen uh, were, but it is definitely a fighting chance uh, for those people. Um, and I really hope that they can uh, establish power and, and get that security over the Taliban. And it doesn't fall into chaos, and we have to go back in there one day in the future. Yeah, right, right. Well, Jason, we'll start to wind down this interview. <clears throat> Is there anything I didn't ask you that you wanted to talk about or uh, any other stories that have kind of floated to the top as we've been sitting here? So I know we can't cover everything, but I'd look, ideally get a, a good cover of your story. Uh, anything you can think of that you, or any closing statements, anything you wanted to, 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 sl to finish off this? Uh... Uh, none that I think can think of. Uh, I, I can definitely say that even though I was, I've been wounded and, uh, and some part disabled, I don't regret any of my service, um, and I still have that really strong sense of duty and that there are uh, a, a stronger purpose out there, um, and that's why I want to get into you know, public service. Um, I might not be you know, wielding a, a gun and, and leading Marines anymore, but uh, I still feel like I can do a lot of good, and I think uh, creating awareness so that we can help our veterans, and um, but also get are the civilian population, the you know the regular uh, residents, uh, to learn more about what this generation has just went through, uh, is I think that's just as important. Um, and I think 
exactly what we're doing here um, is definitely a huge part of that. Uh, and I do believe that the, those that just went through these two wars can be and will be the next greatest generation. Uh, the amount of technology and skills that they have to go through, even for infantry like me, uh, it's just, it's, it's pretty awesome. And I feel like that we can really uh, take charge and, and excel this country, uh, whether it's through business or you know, uh, clean energy or anything like that. Uh, I really do feel like we're, we're the ones to do it. Oh, excellent. Oh, excellent. Well, with that, with that statement, we'll, uh, we'll close down the interview. I want to thank you for sitting down to tell your story, but uh, more importantly, I want to thank you for your service to our country. Thank you.